it's about the geopolitics of Europe. And historical revisionism is an ideological struggle um, under which a lot of the power politics that influence our lives is now being played out. And it certainly explains much of the antagonism towards Russia, even though it's no longer a socialist country. The day of the crude Holocaust denier is largely over. I know that's quite a bold statement, but the, the failed libel case that was brought by the egotist and the self-publicist Irving um, brought many of their main contentions crashing down around them. And that was back in April 2000. Um, in places there risen new forces in many ways much more powerful and much less fringe. These are the historical revisionists. They're people who want to challenge and revise the accepted outcomes of World War II. And they're grouped around an organization called the Prague Declaration Movement. The Prague Declaration Movement have made a cult out of the German Soviet Pact of Non-Aggression. And they kind of nominate it as the trigger for World War II. If that was the case, which they say it is the case, that basically makes Germany and the Soviet Union equally culpable for starting the war. Along those lines, they've created a new political category of red-brown equivalents, which is basically the idea that communism equals fascism but also of a double genocide, that there were other um, uh, holocausts or genocides that were the equivalent to the one perpetrated by the Nazis. And they've also tried to eclipse and do away with Holocaust Memorial Day, which was established by the United Nations General Assembly uh, at its 42nd plenary in 2005. And along these lines, the very the especially slippery EU Council refers not to double genocide, but to a reconciliation of history, i.e. it's a sort of postmodern history of equal terrible events. The Prague Declaration Movement have had a tremendous amount of success. They've captured the centre ground in the EU Parliament in August 2019, when to the shock of many, including many communists, um, the views of the Prague Declaration Movement were supported by Labour MEPs. I think that they, the Prague Declaration Movement has seen the capture of the Social Democrats and quite a few Greens in the MEP um, as a major and strategic achievement, but I suspect they won't be stopping there. Um, and there will be an attempt to completely isolate and stigmatise those communists who are represented in the EU Parliament. So historical revisionists, as opposed to Holocaust deniers, have broadened their message, they've widened their audience, they've made it younger, which is important when there are no longer the testimonials uh, of living survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, so much of the discussion now is digital. Um, they are writing, they're energetically writing history books. There's lots of grants around if you want to write a book that questions, uh, um, that, uh, historic, that's a historical revisionist book. They're printing newspapers, they're opening museums, including one in Brussels that's costing 50 million euros and characteristically is taking twice as long to build as was planned and costing twice as much. They're changing street names, they're pulling down monuments and tributes to wartime liberators, and they're putting them up for pro-Nazi collaborators. There are now 320 monuments and street names in 16 countries given over to, the, to mark the those who participated in the Holocaust. Um, most have been established in the last 30 years after the wall came down. And the Prague Declaration Movement is holding conferences, it's power networking, it's power broking, it's actively involved in social media, and yes, it's having its motions become resolutions in the EU Parliament. 
So how have they actually achieved this? I think it's important to recognize that Holocaust deniers are not the same as revisionists and it's, it's harder to argue with them because of that. Deniers just deny, they, they lie and they distort, but they deny that something happened. Revisionists relativize the Holocaust. They will accept that something went wrong. Uh, they'll probably mumble about the numbers and then say that it was only one of many such holocausts. Deborah Lipstadt called it the yes but syndrome. And yes but is now government policy in countries such as Poland, Lithuania and the Ukraine. Fortunately not in Germany, which um, has an honourable role, uh, an honourable record in accepting its role. And it is state policy not to deny or obfuscate the Holocaust. So revisionist forces have focused on that German Soviet pact as the starting point of World War II. And this is the core of their argument. The pact was signed in August 1939, just days before the war began. They focus on the pact to cover up for the betrayal at Munich in September 38, which happened fully a year before. If you're looking for a trigger for the war, then Munich truly is the villain of the peace. This used to be conventional wisdom and was broadly accepted. Um, in September 1938, Hitler demanded land in Czechoslovakia um, that, was, that had the potential to, to block him. It included what they called in the Sudetenland, where there were a lot of Germans living, um, the, the, uh, the main defense lines of Czechoslovakia and a very sizable army. And so a meeting between Chamberlain, Hitler, Deladier and Mussolini was held in which Hitler was basically gifted that land. But of course, he then proceeded to annex the rest. Munich was Chamberlain's desperate move to stop Czechoslovakia becoming another Spain. The Czechs were actually better armed and better organized and wanted to defend themselves. And Spain then hadn't yet fallen. So he feared Czechoslovakia and Spain kicking off at the same time. People knew the importance of Munich at that time. Churchill said, England has been offered a choice between war and shame. She has chosen shame and will get war. Willie Gallagher, the lone communist MP, said of Munich, the national government are not isolating Soviet Russia, they are isolating Britain. And later he said, and according to the report, he was shouted down, if I were asked the question, did the Prime Minister save the peace? I should answer with an emphatic no. The Prime Minister saved Hitler. So at that time, people were very clear that Munich would mean war. And the net outcome of Munich was to create this unbroken belt of fascism from the North Sea and the Baltic through the centre and heart of Europe and down into the Mediterranean. And if very shortly afterwards you add Franco, it extended that belt, that belt all the way from Lithuania to North Africa. The carve up at Munich took place 44 weeks before the German Soviet Pact of Non-Aggression was signed. So it's very unlikely that it was that latter pact that started the war. You, you can see why I've made the betrayal of uh, Czechoslovakia a turning point issue and why it's so important not to allow the German Soviet pact to be portrayed as the spark for war. From a Soviet point of view, it was basically a desperate throw of the dice uh, to buy time before the inevitable happened. So the Prague Declaration movement says that, this, that the pact is the starting point of World War II, but it forgets the Japanese invasion of China and Nanjing, ignoring the Soviet-Japanese border war of 1931 to 39, 
the Anglo-German Naval Pact, which gave an equivalence in submarine building to Germany and Britain. That was, we can thank Sir John Simon for that, which nearly brought Britain to its knees between 1939 and 43. You can forget the invasion of Abyssinia, the occupation of the Rhineland, the annexation of Austria, the degradation of Spain, grabbing parts of the Baltic, the, the carve up at Munich and Czechoslovakia. There's plenty of other things to choose from when you say what contributed to or what started the war. Um, I, I think that although the, the so, so there were many wars being fought between 1931 and 45, it, it was a war of classes. It was a war of the new versus the declining empires of democracy against fascism and a conflict between socialism and barbarism. But the important thing is that the evils, the twin evils of the 30s that almost guaranteed war and were championed by the British government were appease appeasement and non-intervention. And that meant that time and again, Britain failed to defend the democratic countries or those who were being facing uh, fascist aggression. So by the time the war came to an end, many would see that that was a kind of knockout blow for fascism. But in many countries, um, it's, it's the case that it was really an unfinished business. And if you ever have an idle 20 minutes to, to Google, have a look at what happened when the Ukraine started to split up. And all the countries that started to make territorial claims against each other, and even now have lodged territorial and boundary claims. Um, they are claims that go back to 1945. So for, for the right, 1945 wasn't unfinished business, it was just that they were defeated. But of course, now they are back. So up, up to the late 70s, the detailed causes of the war were, were contested amongst scholars. And you would expect that and, and not worry about that. But there was a general acceptance that the right people won. And, and if you doubted, you just looked at, you just checked who was hung at the trials after Nuremberg or Tokyo. But with the demise of the Soviet Union, that, that narrative started to change. Uh, in, by 2004, Cameron acquiesced in the addition of 10 new, mainly Central and Eastern European accession states into the EU. And that skewed the EU to the right at the same time as social democracy was disintegrating and losing its grip. Some of the new states, particularly from the Baltic and in the East, advocated a kind of shared post-1945 European legacy, by which they meant that citizens in victor countries had to share the same narrative as those who'd been defeated or occupied. In other words, there was no difference between those countries which had fought Nazism and those with Quisling style governments who, in some cases, enthusiastically joined it. And to some of those countries, the EU could become a means of imposing their view on everybody else. So I'm very clear, this isn't saying that the EU is a fascist organisation. Absolutely not. There are those within it who do not accept the post-1945 settlement and have now found a way of forcing the EU to the right to promote this common European narrative. By June 2008, the Prague Declaration on European Conscience and Communism was published, and its signatories networked and found powerful allies, including ex-Prime Minister Thatcher and Sarkozy. But it was successfully resisted in Britain in a parliamentary alliance led by John Mann, MP. I think only one Brit signed the uh, Prague Declaration. Mann referred to it as an industrial scale rewriting of history. And then in Parliament, he said that the Prague Declaration 
is just a traditional form of prejudice rewritten in a modern context. In essence, it's trying to equate communism and Judaism as one conspiracy and rewrite history from a nationalist point of view. So the, the Prague Declaration movement engaged in hardcore obfuscation of the Holocaust. They didn't deny it, they just said that it was one of many, it never happened in their country, so it was nothing to do with them, even though that was a lie. They talked of twin totalitarian systems, but communism was worse because it, it lasted so much longer and involved denial of the right to own property. And anyway, the Jews were all communists. And in Hungary, it's not uncommon now for the government to refer to those who previously were communists, uh, who were the Jews, who have now become the capitalists. And they have these giant posters, we will keep you free from Soros and Brussels. Uh, 2010 was a turning point. Um, an all party group of MEPs established a common Europe, common history project to reconcile the different historical narratives in Europe and to consolidate them into a united European memory of the past. That's their words, not mine. So the outcome sought to impose a common model on school curricula throughout the EU. In Britain, it gained no followers, including it was completely blocked in the Department for Education. This is the start of the serious attempt to equate Nazism and communism, which provoked the legendary director of the Wiesenthal Center, Ephraim Zurov, to say that the perpetrators of Auschwitz cannot be compared to its liberators. But before Ephraim Zurov, there was the Stockholm Declaration of 2000, which had been signed by 43 governments, including 23 heads of state, which shaped the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IHRA. In their eight point charter, there's not a single mention of communism, Marxism, the USSR, or the German Soviet Pact of Non-Aggression. So you can see that there's been a really significant shift from Stockholm and now the Prague Declaration movement is on the offensive. Um, later in August 2010, the EU Parliament sponsored a European Day of Remembrance, which coincided with the German Soviet pact, but was really designed. It was a thinly veiled attempt, if you like, to knock out Holocaust Memorial Day. And in December of the same year, the EU Commission was pressed by countries like Latvia and Bulgaria, Romania and the Czech Republic to make the approval, denial or belittling of communist crimes an EU-wide criminal offence. Think about that, because we, we were still members then. The Commission was divided. Uh, they then used subsidiarity and said, well, you can basically prosecute in your countries, but we're not going to make an EU wide uh, um, uh, ruling. But that was the start of the outlawing of the symbols of communism. Since then, a lot has happened. Um, I, I wrote a book some years ago called Freedom from Tyranny and um, said that at the time, quite wrongly, actually, that the historical revisionist movement had no boots on the ground. And then up, up promptly came the maiden uh, movement in the Ukraine to prove me wrong. So uh, the res net result of maiden is to have open Nazis in government for the first time in 70 years. Um, in 2018, Poland made it a criminal offense to accuse the country of complicity in Nazi crimes. Uh, protest forced a retreat, but it is a, a civil crime nonetheless. And in 2019, the Lithuanian parliament drafted a bill to outlaw any attempt to claim that its citizens participated in the Holocaust. And I'm gonna say this despite overwhelmingly overwhelming evidence. But if you refer to genocide in the singular, Lithuania, as opposed to the double genocide, you can get up to two years in prison, and in the Ukraine, you can now get up to 10. 
And in the Ukraine, it's more than just street names that are changing. It's Stepan Bandera has actually been restored with uh, full government honours and scorns are named after him. So historical revisionism is no longer a sideshow and it's strategic in the battle of ideas. It's much more than whose history is right. Um, many of the world standards, such as the United Nations Genocide Convention, which was established in So I'm arguing that if you allow the unravelling of that testimony and that outcome of Nuremberg, then you're also undoing the fabric of the laws and the institutions and the democratic culture and the historical memory um, that, that would aid the right. Um, and if you undo that post-war uh, settlement of ideas, you're also starting to unravel the boundary settlements as well. So it's, it's, it's a recipe for um, cap inter imperialist and intercapitalist rivalry, particularly in the East. So just finally, what can we do? Um, I, I always say that if communists speak at a meeting on their own, which is a bad thing to do because I'm speaking at a meeting on my own, then we're doing things the wrong way. And, and I think that if you look at where communist parties have been destroyed, labor movements very quickly are suppressed and minorities are left vulnerable to attack. You just have to look at the, the interwar years to prove that. Italy, Portugal, Germany, Spain, and then France. Press freedom is erased first, then parliaments can be broken. And this, this process is actually happening now in countries such as the Ukraine, Hungary, Romania and Lithuania. And if it wasn't for the women of Poland, probably in Poland too. Um, to fight effectively against the red-brown ideas and uh, Holocaust denial and revisionism of a historical kind, I think we've got to bring together everybody under threat not just communists, not just socialists, not just the left, anybody that has a stake in it. it it's, it's interesting that um, when uh, the comrades were advertising for this meeting, they picked a quote from John Mann, who I know has bad history with Corbyn. Um, and, and it was, I, I was saying that yes, he does have that history with Corbyn, but he also led the struggle against the Prague Declaration movement and stopped it getting roots here. And we have to get used to speaking on platforms with people they may not like us, they politically may not agree with us, but that there's there are uh, veterans groups, civic groups, language groups, there are religions, there are trade unions, there are political parties, there are historical history scholars, there are lawyers. Th these are all people that can and need to be brought together to challenge historical revisionism. And, and to work together, people are going to have to leave their water pistols in their holsters. But the alternative is truly